Welcome back. Welcome back to another episode of the Built for Anything podcast. I am your host, Hertz, and my guest today is Joshua Wilson, aka J. Will, who is also a fellow podcaster. He is the co host for the popular podcast called Don't Take It Personal. And we go into a lot of things, guys. We talk about the music industry, we talk about acting. We talk about uh, being in a relationship and, and having it just fall apart and having to recover from that. Uh, we talk about also advice to the fellas out there, man, being in a relationship before you actually have your it together. OK, it's a really, really good conversation. Um, this guy is super, super talented, man. Like I mentioned before, he's been in media for a while. He's also acting, writing, done short films. I mean... This guy is just super multi-talented, so I'm really, really happy to have him on the podcast, and I think you guys are going to really, really enjoy the the conversation. This is a very, very meaty, meaty podcast, okay? So definitely make sure that you sit down and you really absorb the information that you're hearing, okay? And if you enjoy this episode, I do got to let you know, definitely check out some of the other episodes. Leave a review on iTunes, please. It helps the show, okay? So make sure you leave a uh, a review there, hopefully five stars. Okay. And also if you enjoy my content and you want me to keep doing these episodes, particularly ad free, please consider signing up to my Patreon. The link will be below. Um, it does help out the show. And some of the perks you get from Patreon is that you're able to watch episodes like this before everyone else, as well as some other exclusive content only for Patreon. So Definitely take a look at that. Check out those benefits. Without further ado, let's get right into this episode. It's 2019. I'm hype. Y'all gonna enjoy this. Peace and love. It's your boy. I'll catch you on the next one. All right? Welcome, everybody, to the Bill for Anything podcast. Man, I got a guest here that I'm really, really excited about, man. Joshua, a.k.a. J. Will. Yes, yes. <laughs> Say what's up to the people, man. Hello, world. It is your boy, Joshua Wilson, a.k.a. J. Will, here with the Built for Anything podcast. I am a fan, which I've expressed, so I appreciate I'm that. happy to be here, man. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Actor. Yes. Um, fellow podcaster. Of course. Filmmaker. Man, we got a lot. We got a lot of good things to talk about, man. Yeah, we do. Let's 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 start off with some basics. Um so again, I've had a lot of guests on here. Most people are not from here, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's the funny thing about uh, Dallas, Texas. And like, people come from everywhere. I come from New York. You got people coming from the West Coast, etc. Are you a native Texan, or did you come from somewhere else? I am a native Texan, um, mm -hmm. but I'm from a town that I'm sure no one listening has ever heard of called Big Spring, Texas. Shout out to Big Spring. Okay. One thing about me is interesting. No matter what I do, whether I'm doing an interview or anything like that, I always shout out my hometown, which is Big Spring, Texas. So, so anybody listening, you know, this is for y'all. Shout out to them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but <laughs> is that but, north? Is that uh, north or is that south? It's or? south. It's okay. south. It's 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 Close West Texas. It's considered West Texas. Okay. So Odessa, Abilene, Lubbock area. That's where I'm from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you 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 you're a man of many hats. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, first off, I want to start off with congratulations, man. Just recently, the Cosign Awards. Thank you. Um, you know, you guys won. Uh, best podcast podcast of the year podcast yeah of the year yeah um and it's not just you it's you and the team right um right. i have uh, my co-host uh jacory king aka hollywood cast um he's uh, my co-host we typically have a guest every week um but also my camera person he goes by the name of calvin uh he shoots all our video and our photos we also record at valley of the king studios so our guy uh billy he's like usually our engineer and uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's a solid team effort, man. It's definitely not just me. So definitely not just and me. And the name of the podcast, don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Yeah, right. Um, dude, what? If, if, summarize it. Like what? Well, let's st let's start here. How did it start? What made you even get into that lane? Well, pri I mean, we'll get into the lane. I've done. I did radio prior to podcasting for five years. Okay. So uh, I moved to Dallas seven years ago, two thousand eleven. And from 2011 to 2016, I did a radio show called Live from the Underground, where we typically mostly focused on underground Dallas hip hop. But um, 
I got to a place where eventually anytime a major hip hop artist came through the city, I got to interview them as well, have them on the show. So like Kendrick Lamar, Chance the Rapper, Logic, Joey Badass, SZA, anybody you can think of Mm -hmm. in hip hop and R&B, I probably either interviewed them or worked with them in some capacity. Um, Which one? Which one? Ah, damn, I won't put you on the spot. Yeah, go ahead. But <laughs> which one is your? It was probably your 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 most favorite um, interview that you've done. My favorite interview I've done. It's a three way tie. Mm, I figured it probably. Be yeah, it's a three way tie between the Dream, Joey Badass, and Kendrick Lamar. Mm-hmm. Um, the reason why is because I was able to connect with the, all three of them. Um, in my own particular way, uh, the dream was very candid, you know, very open to all my questions. Even when I tried to stray away from certain topics, he was cool with me going there. He didn't care. Mm. Joey Badass, we got it kind of felt more so like a conversation as opposed to an interview. So I really enjoyed that. And with Kendrick, it was the first time I ever got to interview a major artist. So I had been doing yeah, Kendrick's strict, pretty big. Yeah, <laughs> but he was the first one. It's pretty big. And uh, I and what's interesting about that one is I actually had to sneak backstage to get that one. Mm. Yeah, I didn't. That wasn't an official setup one like the rest of them were. And he was cool with it. He didn't see. Here's the thing. Here's the, here's the, here's for anybody listening. Here's okay. what you do. You always have to act like you're supposed to be there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and no one's gonna ask you any questions. <laughs> so That's what, a secret, what happened was, uh, I had set up everything with his management team to interview him, but they kept giving me the runaround. They kept me like, yeah, yeah we'll get it done. Yeah, 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 yeah we'll we'll get to uh, we we because I was supposed to do it at the meet and greet, mm. and the meet and greet came and went. It got so crazy. It was like, we'll do it later on after the show. Now, I'm not an idiot. I know what that means. You're trying to brush me off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I get to the show. Show's popping. The I'm looking at the back door, and I'm seeing the security guard there. And I'm like, I know if I don't get back there, I'm not getting my interview. And so, <laughs> and so what I did was I looked for the right moment where the security guard turned his back and wasn't paying attention. And I, like, quickly <laughs> went behind him and opened the door and just got back there. At and least now we know how the groupies usually get. Because <laughs> right, I always wonder, like, the women, like, they, dude, I hear that. Yeah, it's, Shout it, out to the security. Yeah, real talk. Jesus Christ. <laughs> but it was, but, um, so I snuck back there and I just acted like I was supposed to be there. When they was kicking people out, I was just like, no, I'm supposed to be here. So they didn't kick me out. Mm-hmm. And there was like two or three other people there interviewing them. So they did their interviews and then I did mine. And that was the first time I interviewed an artist on that level. And what that did was it opened the door for me to get artist interviews with every anybody else that came oh, yeah, to the city yeah, yeah. after that. It was you, like, no yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. Especially he's one of the biggest artists out there. Exactly. You, know, you got him, Cole, um, especially running the new generation mm-hmm. of music. You get that. Forget it. I also saw you had a picture with uh, Nipsey. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you got a chance to, to interview him, but you, I know you, you clearly you, you interacted with him. I didn't get to interview him, um, but I did interact with him for a bit. Uh, just it was this private uh, meet and greet for media. We were all at uh, Top Golf of all places. And we were just kicking at all, all. All of us kicking at Top Golf. Top Golf. Yeah. But it was it was cool, man. Um, and I had met Nipsey prior too. Okay. Um, a lot of these artists, it's interesting because they meet thousands of people every day. A lot of them every now and then will actually remember interactions we've had before. Mm. So uh, he he was one of them where we actually have interacted before and we were just having a catch up conversation. Mm-hmm. Was um man, in terms of his music, man, I love what he, he has album of the year. Out. Yeah. In my <laughs> opinion, you know, speaking of Nipsey, yeah, man, I, I don't even know how that's even a debate. But I'll tell you one thing about him. I just respect is just the hustle, man. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I respect it. You know, I mean, it's in his name. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> like you gotta respect the hustle, though, man. I mean, the guy is selling CDs, you know, mixtapes for hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. You know, it really talks to the psychology of the whole price and value. Yeah. Right. It's the reason why people are running around with four hundred, five hundred dollar belts that is made of the same materials, fifty dollar belts. Right. It's like Agreed. the name. It's 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 what you think. Um, people who are watching or people who see you with that is associating with. Right. So he. He felt like, hey, I'm putting out a good product, and if people clearly people got the money to do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so he just changed the game with that, but definitely much success to him, man. Um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you though, like, which out of all the things, and, and we're gonna touch on a few of the other things, but just right away, out of out of all the things that you're involved in, the podcasting, mm-hmm. the acting, um, producing films, uh, etc., like 
which would you say, and I know this is a hard one, <laughs> but which would you say is like, man, like that's really where my heart is or like it's, it's, it's I'm more, I, I, again, it's a, it might be a tough yeah. thing for you. It might be where it's like, okay, nah, that, I started with that. That's really kind of, you know, get me going. But is there, are they all kind of equal? It's actually not a hard question at all. Okay. It's yeah. acting for sure. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Acting for sure. That's what, that's what the genesis of all of this started for me. Um, I've been acting ever since I was 10 years old. Mm. I've been doing theater, whether it was in the church or community or when I, of course, when I got to junior high and high school and I even went to college for it, um, acting for sure. Mm-hmm. Everything else is a byproduct of, of me being an actor. Who are some of the actors that you kind of look up to? Or Oh man. Uh, Denzel, of course is my favorite. Yeah, I and I know that's like the typical black yeah, yeah. <laughs> actor thing to say. I get it. Trust me. I get it. But no, here's, but I have my reasons. Catalog. You can't. Uh, yeah. Okay. But my reasons is this, all mm-hmm. the people I'm going to mention, they all fit this criteria of when they're on the screen, my eyes are on nobody else but them. They mm. completely capture my attention and I don't want to see nobody else but them. And when they're off the screen, I want to see when they're back on the screen. So Denzel's my number one, obviously. Uh, I'm a huge Tom Hanks fan. Mm. I think Tom Hanks okay. is is in the conversation of greatest actor of all time with Robert De Niro. Um, I'm a huge Brad Pitt fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love Whoopi Goldberg. Mm-hmm. She's one of my creative idols. Love Whoopi Goldberg. I would also say, I'm, I'm people probably gonna give me flack for this, but I also admire like the way actors and actresses handle their careers. So making good choices. Mm-hmm. And so far, Michael B. Jordan is making great choices with his career. Mm-hmm. So I admire him as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, also Ryan Gosling, so that's probably my the the main ones that come to mind. Yeah, Ryan Gosling, man. You mean Cougar? Huh? Not Cougar, not Ryan, not Ryan Cougar. Well, he's a filmmaker. Okay, I thought, okay, okay. We're okay, talking okay. about actors, you know. Uh, okay. Yeah, when, yeah. when you was mentioning respect, I thought you meant in terms of. Well, if we're just talking yeah, about yeah. actors, then yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we're talking Go about Gosling. filmmakers, mm-hmm. obviously Ryan Coogler. He's my like my that. main one that I love is Robert Townsend. Okay. Huge. Like, if I had to say the person who who inspired me the most as a creative is Robert Townsend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I saw that you you mentioned somewhere on your uh, social media that you're gonna be having your one of your goals is to get five films into the Sundance. Mm-hmm. I want you to talk about like what what's the importance of having an independent film and and having it on that platform. Well, I mean, if you're in the film industry, Sundance is like a rite of passage. Okay. It's you know whether you're in a film that's gotten into Sundance or you've made one that's gotten into Sundance, it's the ultimate stamp of approval. That's where everybody in Hollywood goes to for that period of time mm-hmm. to either buy a film or sell a film or showcase a film or make connections. Whether it's mm-hmm. a, a sales sales rep or a lawyer or an executive or a writer, etc., that's where you go or that's that's the ultimate stamp of approval. So. Um, I just, I started getting into making my own projects a few years ago. Cause you know, I, I did the typical actor thing where I auditioned for any and everything I've auditioned, I auditioned for straight out of Compton empire early on, mm. um, a couple of high profile projects. And some of them I lost out to, uh, mainly because like, for example, straight out of Compton is probably the worst audition I've ever given. Mm. <laughs> oh man. Worst audition I ever get, I ever gave mainly because I initially auditioned for MC Ren, but they called me back and said, you know, your audition was good, but we actually think you would be better off as easy. E. So I did this like three month process auditioning for easy. E, and my issue was, I was tr- easy is such a recognizable figure, mm-hmm. like especially in hip hop, like you know how he walks, how he talks, how he sounds, mm-hmm. how he looks. Yeah, I was easy. trying. Yeah, I was trying way too hard to emulate him as opposed to just playing, you know, what felt natural to me. And it came off too much as like a like knock off, like a knock off. Of, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And then when you watch straight out of Compton, you see like it was really he didn't sound like easy. Mm-hmm. He kind of didn't look like easy, but he mm-hmm. felt like easy. Right, you know what right, I'm saying? Right, right. And that's what I, I didn't do. I agree. So that's probably why I was the worst audition of my life. But what I learned in that whole process was because some of the roles I were losing to people who had higher connections. So what I learned was, and this is no disrespect to people who do this, because it's it's a necessary aspect of being an actor, auditioning. But what I learned was we're now kind of in a day and age where auditioning 
is kind of a waste of time. Mm. Uh, because you're in this, you're in these rooms and you're, you're, you're going hard all day waiting in line all day to go audition for these things or auditioning over and over again. And you're getting told no for a multitude of different reasons. A big part of that reason is the person who got the role knew somebody who called somebody and called in a favor, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so if I'm losing roles to people like this, I might as well be making my own thing. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happened. So when I made that realization, I put out my first scripted series called matters of the heart in 2016 that I wrote, produced, directed, and starred in myself. Mm -hmm. And from there, I've just been building up uh, my own catalog of projects that I've created myself. So how many you've done so well, far? Um, I've just done Matters of the Heart, but here's okay. what I learned after Matters of the Heart, okay. because it took me a year and a half to make. Mm -hmm. And people were done, and I put all the episodes out at once, like Netflix style, binge-worthy style, right? Oh, okay. It was five okay. episodes. And so you could finish all five episodes maybe in like an hour and a half because they were like 15 to 20 minute episodes. Mm -hmm. What I realized is this this year and a half worth of work that I put in, people were done with an hour and a half and were asking me for the next thing. Mm. And I was like, dog, just consume this. Like mm. I, I just spent all this time on this and you're asking for the next thing. So mm -hmm. what I learned was content is king. Mm -hmm. People want an abundance of things. Like they want consistency. They mm -hmm. want you to constantly have something next. Mm -hmm. So I've just been building everything up mm -hmm. to where the next time I come out, it's not going to be a while before you see something else, mm -hmm. you know? So that's where the idea for multiple films came from. Not so, just one, but like five, five to seven. So do you regret putting them all out at once? Or would you, if you could go back or going forward, mm -hmm. would you, cause you have this series, so you have yeah. multiple episodes. Would it be like, you know what, let me put them out weekly. Or are you saying I still will put them all out at once. I just know that I need to be able to follow up in a month yeah. you know after that where that's doing the same thing i would be the second one where okay. like i didn't i don't i'm still would have put it all out at once okay. but i just would have had something ready to go soon after so yeah so i've just been building up since then writing a multitude i have maybe 30 scripts mm -hmm. now that i've just been like knocking out back to back as far as like getting them filmed and, and prepped and ready to go so my goal is to get them all into sundance um and I believe in that goal. I believe I'll yeah, be able to do it. Absolutely. I'm, I, I truly believe that. So, um, I mean, and even if it doesn't happen, I have a backup plan, but my plan is to get him into Sundance. That's not, nah, man. And that's, that's the goal you got to chase. Mm -hmm. You got to go after plan A. Plan A don't work. Do plan B. Yeah. Which is revert back to plan A. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is adjust I like plan that. Yeah. Adjust plan A. I like plan that. C, go back to plan yeah. A. And fix but plan you, A. So, like, that's really what got me into Because if you were to ask me 10 years ago mm -hmm. um, if I ever would have written my own script, I would have said no. If you would ask me 10 years ago if I ever directed anything or produced anything, I would have said no. All I cared about was acting. Mm -hmm. But, you know... You know, being that I have a relationship with God, you know, God has a way of putting me basically saying mm -hmm. to me in his own kind of way, like, because I have a tendency, we all as people have a tendency right. to do the bare minimum sometimes. Mm -hmm. To me, now looking back, the bare minimum for me is just acting mm -hmm. when I could do so much more. Mm -hmm. So God had a way of telling me eventually, like, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to be doing more than just acting here, son. Mm -hmm. I, I got a bigger plan for you. And now I wouldn't have had it any other way. It kind of goes back to that saying, man makes plans and God laughs. Oh, that's like <laughs> that's like the plan, theme of my life. It. And he's just like, oh, no, no. That's the theme else. of my life because so many things that have happened to me were nowhere near planned whatsoever. Like me getting in the media wasn't planned. Mm -hmm. It was completely by accident. Mm -hmm. I was actually at school. I was in the radio department hanging out with some friends and I was just making everybody laugh. I was cracking everybody up. The station manager was there and was like, hey, we have openings for some radio shows on the school's network. Do you want to have one? Mm hmm. And that's how it started. That's how Live from the Underground started. Mm -hmm. I was just a college radio show, and then it grew into what it did because it lasted five years. Um, but, yeah, media was never a part of my plan. So with the acting, though, what what gravitated you towards that? Like, what is it about it that really draws you in, that, you, that really makes it, like, the one that you're most passionate about? What is it about it? Well... Or is it anything specific? It it is. It's mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a detailed reason. Um, 
when I was a kid, I got picked on a lot, a lot, you know, and this is like, everybody says like, oh, everybody got picked on, but like, nah, I'm talking about like getting thrown in dumpsters every day after school, you know, nice. or like getting squirrelies or, you know, like I got really picked on mm-hmm. and because it's so outrageous, some of the things that happened to me, a lot of people that I would try to tell things that were happening to me, they were like, oh, you're overreacting or that can't be true. Like, you sure that's really what happened? So a lot of times I would get these things happen to me and and I just just had to deal with them, find another way to to handle my issues. Uh, The only escape I really had was TV and movies. Mm. I would come home, I would turn on Nickelodeon, you know, all that, or Keenan and Kel or something, you know, I know I'm showing my age. I'm only 27. So, <laughs> uh, so, uh, right. so like Listen, de- even people now, man, we still use movies, music as an escape. Yeah. So, I mean, there was literally, I felt like that's all I had at one point in time was TV and movies. You know, these characters on TV that I could see myself in or these characters in TV that were people I aspired to be like, mm-hmm. or these characters on TV and film that just, inspired me you know and it, it, it was I mean it, it goes as far back I remember I didn't even notice but I remember I had a teacher tell me when I was in when I was already grown she was like oh do you remember when you were in my class and you mm-hmm. would see a new Disney movie and you would come in singing and I'm like no nah, I don't remember that <laughs> <laughs> don't be spreading rumors lady but she had it on video she oh, had it on man. video of me coming in class one day seeing a whole new world from Aladdin <laughs> like I just loved <laughs> That was my escape. That was my mm-hmm. thing. And, but I never thought that I could do it myself, though. It kind of seemed like a otherworldly oh, thing mm-hmm. until I was 10 years old. And uh, I was the only kid at my church that wasn't in the youth church activities. I wasn't in the choir. I wasn't doing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that kind of embarrassed my mom a little bit, if I'm going to be completely honest, because mm-hmm. uh, the youth director asked me one day, Josh, you know, why don't you be we, we haven't been involved in anything. Would you like to be in the upcoming play? And before I could say no, my mom comes up behind me. Yeah, he'll do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> He's she like, saw something yeah, she, she was like, no, she just wanted me to like go do something, do something. Mm-hmm. She was like, he'll do it. Mm-hmm. What do you want him to do? She was like, well, we have this play coming. She said, he'll do it. What part do you want him to play? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm sitting there looking at her like what Shout are you doing moms. and she uh, was like well you know we don't have anybody to play jesus he was like well you got one now mm. and <laughs> so imagine the first part the first play you've ever done and you're playing jesus christ mm-hmm. like <laughs> so you, you you mentioned you mentioned to me um earlier that you know your pops is a pastor yeah was, yeah i'm assuming was he a pastor back then you know yeah he's uh he's been uh pastor for over 30 years okay. um my parents are divorced though okay so uh they got divorced when i was two okay so i stayed with my mom my dad was still very much in my life i saw him every i would visit him every summer because he moved actually to the dfw area okay when i was uh when i believe i was eight years old okay and so i would come visit him every summer after that um was he proud? Of, the reason why I bring it up because you taking on that role, and yeah, him having those, you know, him being tied to the religion. Oh, he was very. He was, was he kind of happy. About he was very that? proud of was that. He, okay, that's, very that's proud of that. Even though I'm about. sweating bullets, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm playing Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. <laughs> black <laughs> and, Jesus. And the if whole listen, he's black. Bro. Yeah, and the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> but the whole time I'm preparing for this role, every rehearsal, every practice, I'm dreading it. I'm like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. What? No, I don't want to do this. I was I was defiant the whole time. But you know that that typical, I know, stereotypical when you're on stage at the end of the the play and you get mm-hmm. that standing ovation, you oh, get that bug, right? Yeah, that everybody addiction. says that. Mm-hmm. But it's true. When when you're standing on that stage and everybody is applauding and looking at you and telling you what a job a good job you did, it's addicting. Mm. It's addicting and it and it makes you go, okay, when's the next time I can get this feeling again? Mm-hmm. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I did every play that they, they allowed me to do at church. I eventually started doing plays all over the community with community theater. I got into junior high and started doing it at junior high and in high school, of course. Mm-hmm. And um, what was interesting when I got to junior high, though, in high school was I was the only black kid in my theater. 
the only one. All the other, because there's not a lot of black kids where I'm from. It's mostly Hispanic. Then it's then it's white, mostly white. After that, and there's not a lot of black kids that go that are from where I'm from. So all the black kids, they were all in sports. Mm-hmm. I was the only one in theater. Um, but yeah, like I I would say that that was the initial bug that got me was just um, needing an escape. And my mom pushing me into it. And I guarantee you, if you ask her, she would tell you, I didn't think he would actually run with it. I just mm-hmm. wanted him to do something, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. Nah, that's what's up, man. What What would you say so far has been a big milestone for you that you've accomplished in that in that um, in terms of acting? Definitely. Is it I- producing your own films? Is it were you in another movie for somebody else? Was there what was that moment that you felt like? And I'm 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 heading in the right direction. It was definitely the premiere for Matters of the Heart. Okay. And it was like oh, I can just name multiple moments from the night. One showing up and seeing that they put my name on the marquee. That's what's up. Like cuz it said Joshua Wilson presents Matters of the Heart. I didn't even know they were doing that. Mm-hmm. I didn't ask for that. I didn't put in I didn't know. So showing up to the theater and it says that. First of all, mind blown. Um and then, of course, when you throw a premiere, you you want people to show up. So I didn't yeah. know if anybody was going to show yeah. up. Yeah. So we packed it out. We packed out the Texas Theater on a random Tuesday night, and and then seeing people's reaction to it. We we showed all five episodes back to back at the theater, and everybody reacting to it, laughing, enjoying it, having a good time. Wow! And then standing on that stage afterwards, and just seeing how everybody reacted to it, it was. I don't think I'll ever have a moment like that again. Well, until I win my Oscar, but uh, <laughs> hey, speaking into existence, brother. Uh, oh yeah, I'm a, I consider myself a future EGOT recipient. So mm-hmm. if, for people who don't know, that's an Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. Only a few people have achieved all four. Nice. Uh, the most recent is John Legend. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely feel like that's in my future. So mm-hmm. I'm speaking into existence. But that's yeah, until right. I win my Oscar, that will be the 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 crown like jewel uh, experience of me being an actor so far. How did, how would you summarize the the web series though? Because I don't know, like for for people out there who haven't seen it or is not aware of it, like how would you describe that? What was the content like? Is it was it well, comedy? Was it? It's comedy for sure. Okay. But um, I based it off of so I was in a relationship for five years. Um, high school sweetheart. We all through high school through college we were together, and then one day she just left. She just left. Really, no explanation just um broke it off and just left and um i took it really hard like extremely hard you know prior to prior to i mean in my life i knew where i wanted to go like i've been preparing to be in the entertainment industry since i was 16 like i i I had it set in my mind this is what i'm gonna do this is where i'm gonna go so i've been preparing for it since i was 16 so i know how to deal with certain things that get thrown at me in the entertainment industry one thing I never prepared for was how to deal with heartbreak. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I tell you, brother. It's, and, it's, it's and hard. It's, it, hard it's a hard first, pill man. to swallow. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And and women typically get the the notion, like the stigma of being emotional and things like that. But men, we can be pretty emotional too. We feel things too. So uh I kind of started writing from the perspective of um well, I started writing it because I was hanging out with some friends and they were all clowning me like, oh, get over her. Mm-hmm. Like, you're being a punk, Typical. yada, yada, yada. And then I left and the guy that was clowning me the most called me. He was like, hey, man, I went through the exact same thing. Like, and he was just talking to me like, you get through it. It gets, it, eventually you'll get past it and you'll grow out of it, yada, yada, yada. And I'm sitting here thinking, but you was just clowning me in front of everybody else. <laughs> so, if, yeah, they got to give you shit about yeah, it. Yeah, so, but, um, but it got me thinking like, yeah, other how many other it. people are going through this and mm-hmm. just afraid to talk about it? Mm. So the whole so the way I would describe matters of the heart is the male perspective of heartbreak, like uh, but not only the male perspective, but a black male perspective, because mm-hmm. white men are able to be vulnerable about their heartbreak and it'd be OK. Like you watch movies like Forgetting Sarah Marshall or Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist or 500 Days of Summer. And it's OK mm-hmm. for them to be vulnerable and to show mm-hmm. heartbreak. But for us, we're supposed to be machismo and like, you know, mm-hmm. I forget that girl, yada, yada, yada. But 
that's not my experience. I was hurt. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to show a comedic spin on that. That's so I would say the best way to describe Mads of the Heart is a black male perspective on heartbreak. Mm -hmm. And how can people see it now? It's on YouTube currently. Yeah, it's on YouTube currently. Yeah, Yeah, I'll I'll definitely leave the links uh, down below for sure. I want I want to touch I want to go back to the podcast real quick. Yeah. Um because I know you mentioned it's not just you, it's you and the co you, you know you got your your co-host. Yeah. Um describe again what's the nature you said hip hop, mm-hmm. right? So you guys just describe it for those people out there who haven't listened who, you know, just tell them a little bit about it. Well, it's really just an unfiltered way of presenting not only what's going on currently in urban culture but just in our personal lives. Mm. Um you know, after doing Live from the Underground for five years, um, I, I said this actually recently. Um, you know, I've done theater since I was 10. It's very structured, very choreographed, very rehearsed. And then I did radio for five years, very structured, very rehearsed, very planned. I kind of hit a point in my life where I was like, I don't really want to, when it comes to this aspect, I don't really want to plan it. I don't really want to follow a structure. I just want to do what feels right. right. So nine times out of 10, we'll go into the room without a plan. We just start talking, you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And it's about, and it's really about how we feel about things as opposed to, you know, just really any type of plan or structure. So it's like you go, really, you come to the show for our perspectives, really. Mm -hmm. And it's whatever we choose to talk about that day is what we choose to talk about that day. So it's, it's a really unfiltered, unscheduled, unplanned way of, uh, having a conversation with someone that you consider a good friend of yours. So when I stopped doing live from the underground, I had no plans of getting back in the media mm-hmm. whatsoever. I was going to be full focused on being an actor and filmmaker. I was going to make my projects and that's it. But I don't really like talking on social media. I don't like really venting. I got you. On, on it gets social- old pretty quick. Yeah, I, I, I don't like doing that. I don't like expressing myself in that way. I need a medium to really fully express myself, and media became that thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my co-host, Hollywood Cass, uh, we were cool when we met, but he actually was at the protest that happened a few years ago downtown Dallas that got shot up. I remember that. Um, and he actually broke his leg um, trying to get away from the gunshots. Oh, wow. And so for six weeks, he was laid up in his house, couldn't go anywhere um, because he he broke his leg. Mm -hmm. Um, And so every weekend for those six weeks, I kept him company. I would come by his house and I'd be I probably get there maybe six o'clock at night and then leave at seven o'clock in the morning. Like we would have those type of conversations Mm -hmm. every week. And eventually it was like, yo, this is a podcast. Mm -hmm. This is a show. Mm -hmm. Like, let's just do this. Mm -hmm. And that's what it became. So, like, a lot of people have these plans and these structures to their podcast. And I applaud, like, you're one of those people. And I love what you do. And I've done that so much that when it came to this particular show, I didn't want to do any of that. Mm -hmm. None of it. I think especially if you have a co-host that you you vibe with. Yeah. And um, you guys, you know, you have a rapport outside of the podcast. It makes it easier. Yeah, you for know, sure. Because you can, I'm sure after a numerous episodes, you kind of, it's a team thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, you kind of have a feel of him. He has a feel of you. Right. So you're able to vibe. So you can you can more or less get away with that. Oh, because yeah. Because there is, there is, believe it or not, a structure to it. Because, you know, you know what kind of stuff that you guys want to talk about. And you can kind of know what will get the other person going and mm-hmm. vice versa, I would, I would imagine. Oh, yeah, for sure. And it's like at this point, we know what each other's strengths are. Mm-hmm. I would, I, the way I describe it is um, uh, a coach with a star player. Like, I would consider myself the coach. I set everything up, and he knocks it down. Like, he's clearly mm-hmm. the star of the show. If I had to pick who I think is the biggest draw of the show, it's definitely him. Mm-hmm. Do you guys um, do things independently of each other? Or is every episode usually both of you guys? Oh yeah, it's 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 usually all it's usually both of us for okay. sure. Okay. The only times that it he had it's been me and not him is if he if we have a, a special guest and he can't make it. Like we had Donnell Rollins who who's famously known as Ashley Larry on the Chappelle Show on the show one day, and the only time we could get him on the show was during the day when he had work. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just I had to take that one for the team, you know, mm-hmm. just do it myself. Um, same thing. We had uh, Epic Records MC Nick Grant on the show. And again, only time we could get him was during the day. 
Cass had to work. So that's gotcha. the only thing. But if it was up to me, I'd have Cass with me for those times too. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But that's really the only time it's one without the other. Mm-hmm. Over a hundred thousand streams, man. 150, combined. Hundred fifty. Hundred fifty. Don't shortchange the man now. <laughs> hundred and fifty thousand streams combined across you know, new different platforms, you, you know, Spotify, SoundCloud, all the iTunes, Google mm-hmm. Play, all that good stuff, right? Um first big feat, man. Congratulations on that. Thank you, man. And so, you know, we, we touched on a little bit about, you know, in regards to the cosign uh, awards that you guys uh won. Was that the first one that you guys won? Because I know that's the second event. So. It's the first one we won, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, we were nominated last year, um, and we were also nominated for Dallas Reserve Award last year as well. Okay. Um, and even in my speech, I said I've been nominated as a personality seven times now. Mm-hmm. That was my first win because even with my radio show, we were nominated at the Dallas Reserve Awards multiple times. Mm-hmm. So, But it felt better winning a Cosign Award simply because I've known KG for years. Um, we kind of started at we kind of started in this area around the same time. So a lot of the big interviews I would get, KG would be there too, mm. getting it for Coastline Magazine. Okay. Same with, I'm, I'm saying these people because you had them on your mm-hmm. show, but Chan Lo as well. Mm-hmm. Chan Lo used to run a totally different blog called, uh, well, just it's called Chanlo dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we would all be running in the same circles, getting the same type of interviews, and we kind of built built this camaraderie kind of family this media mm-hmm. family so like me kg chan low we go way back mm-hmm. and um so they so it felt really special getting a cosign award because he knows me mm-hmm. he he knows what i've gone the through to get to and, this point mm-hmm. and so it matters more that he that they awarded me because they know they know that i deserve it they mm-hmm. know what i go through to get what i get mm-hmm. and so it's being awarded by your peers. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's no better feeling than and that. And no better feeling than mm-hmm. that. So I could have got five Dallas Observer Awards, and that would have been cool. But getting that one cosign award really mattered to me. Mm-hmm. And, man, um, and I'm sure it met your team, oh, you yeah. know, it, it, it meant a lot to them. It, it goes to your consistency. Um, yeah, we had all those guys on there, man. Yeah. Uh, for those of you listening, Chan Lo is actually Channing B., all right, Bima. You know, so <laughs> definitely uh she was on the show, man. She's good people. Yeah. All for the sure. people you mentioned are all good people's and you can catch the podcast somewhere down there. So exactly. Check it out. But um, nah, man, that's that that that's awesome. But what do you what would you say you you've been seeing lately in regards to podcasting, right? As a as a fellow podcaster, I, I know what I've seen, mm-hmm. right? And for me, I see like a, a really great opportunity. It's it's a space that is not really dominated yet. Um, by big, you know, corporations or big entities, right? You can kind of get in um, independently, and and if you have something to say and people want to hear it, um, a lot of people are really starting to take podcasting seriously. Yeah. Um, what do you see going on in this industry now, and what what either excites you about it, or what, um, if anything, kind of makes you take a step back? Well, what excites me about it is the fact that it's still fairly new, even though it's been going on for a while. I mean, especially for people like us, because for a while, podcasting was only a white person thing for a long time. If it wasn't for people like Rest in Peace Combat Jack, you know, doing what he did, knocking down that door for us, there wouldn't be a Charlemagne the God doing Brilliant Idiots. There wouldn't be a Joe Budden podcast. There wouldn't be a Tax Stone. There wouldn't be... There wouldn't be a lot. There wouldn't be us. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the door or the wall that Combat Jack knocked down. So I want to say that first of all. Um, But even with it being around as long as it has been, it's still fairly new. Mm -hmm. Um, Like even like hip hop has been around for over 40 years, but it's still considered like the youngest genre of music. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So it's still somewhat early for podcasting. So it's very, that's what excites me the most is that it's still untapped territory, even though it's been going on for a while. So there's so many opportunities to get certain things going and mm-hmm. and um, get into certain avenues that haven't been touched yet. So that's what excites me about it. What I don't like about it is that it's so easy for some people to create podcasts to the point to where there's so many of them out there without any in, without any real vision, mm-hmm. without any real point of mm-hmm. focus. And so it muddies up the the ground. It muddies up the chances of you getting where you need getting the getting the attention that 
and I'm not even right. saying this because I'm because I'm here, but I'm here because I'm a fan of what you do. But you, the attention that you should be getting for mm-hmm. what you do, it gets muddied up because it's getting into that territory. of Remember when people used to say, oh, I'm a rapper and that used to mm-hmm. actually mean something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you say you're a rapper Don't now, much now. <laughs> it, like people like, look okay. at you like, yeah. OK, yeah, yeah, you're a rapper. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like podcasting okay. is getting to that place. To that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's early on. It's early on. Yeah. There's still a lot of room. Um, actually, uh, I, I just did like a guide, um, around podcasting to help people get started. Mm-hmm. And so I was researching some things and, and something along the lines of what you said came up, you know, the fact that there's still, there's only about 550,000, um, shows. Okay. And that's just iTunes. So we're just going to use iTunes as the barometer being that it's Apple. It's yeah, the biggest, of course. Right. Of course. I'm sure <laughs> there's, there's plenty more, but like only 550,000, right? But yet there's way there's millions of people with cell phones and that's the primary way that they listen to podcasts is through mm-hmm. cell phones. So technically what we're saying is that there's still not enough people doing this to even match the amount of consumption mm. and, and the opportunity out there. Right. It's, it's a way it's, it's a big disparity. And so um, that means a lot of people are starting to get into it. And some of the bigger uh, advertisers haven't really gotten into podcasting yet. Right. They will. They, oh, they, <laughs> See what I'm saying? will. they will. They, they just definitely they, will. They, they make their rounds, you know, but they definitely will because it's 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 long form. Mm-hmm. They can squeeze in a couple of advertisers. Of course. If you have listen, it's all about attention. So if you have a bunch of people, you know, over 150,000 streams, you know, that's that's if you're an advertiser, if you're a big company, you're saying, man, if this person mentioned our, you know, whatever product once, twice mm-hmm. um, and he has access to all these people, she has access to all these people. It could benefit them. Right. And so they'll eventually start to really invest and get into that space. And so but what you do here, like you said, is that people will say, oh, they want to start a podcast, but then they don't know what it's about. Mm -hmm. They just the common thing is like, oh, I just I got a lot of things to say. And I speak about it in my guide where it's like it's not enough that you just you you feel like you could talk about something. Right. Because you'll find out really quickly after five episodes six episodes, eight episodes that either one, people don't necessarily value your opinion. Right. Right. Or two, that you're not really as knowledgeable of said thing as you thought you were. Agreed. Right. And so you have to earn that to where you can speak on it. And then you might find like, you know what, this particular topic is not really something I feel like I can talk on for months, Mm -hmm. years. Then you, you, you gotta switch it. You gotta pivot it. And so, But that's part of the process. Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? And, you know, what's interesting is, too, I think the main thing, if I was going to tell anybody who wanted to get into podcasting or into this industry in the first place, is know what you're doing it for. Because, Mm -hmm. you know, you're going to have to put in a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of money, like... I'm I, I I just counted basically how much I estimated how much money you spent on your equipment alone <laughs> earlier. And it's it's more than most people's yearly paycheck. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I just I don't know if you're willing to put in that much time. And I don't know if most people most are willing to put in that right. time and effort. Right. Like even for us with our podcast, mm-hmm. we strictly did it for fun. Mm-hmm. We had no intention on getting advertisers, had no intentions of winning awards, had no intentions on having actual fans we mm-hmm. were just like this is cool let's do this this will be fun let's have fun mm-hmm. and that's what we did it for mm-hmm. everything else is a, is cherry on top so like the fact that we have over one hundred fifty thousand streams the fact that we have an award now the fact that we have fans that i know will listen every week and then comment on everything and like share it and tell people like yo this is crazy good like i this was a great episode mm-hmm. Like, that's all great, but that's not what we did it for. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I tell people, if you're doing a podcast, do it because you want to do it, not because you're trying to get a look, not because you're trying to get certain things, because I don't know, man. Like, I've seen a lot of people get disappointed that way. Mm-hmm. A mm-hmm. lot of people get disappointed that way. Yeah. When you when you I think when you do anything for the wrong reasons, that is going to require work. Mm-hmm. It's easy for you to come out of it. You know, you won't last. Mm-hmm. You know, the the. The realest thing I've, I remember hearing from Steve Jobs and um, 
again, this is just pa- I'm paraphrasing this. Of course. But he, he basically said that, you know, you have to really love what it is that you're doing because a sane person, when it's not going right, a sane person is going to say, OK, and they're going to move on. Most people are not going to want to go through that adversity. Right. And so, like you said, you might come a time where you're putting in work, got your head down and nobody's seeing it yet. You see what I'm saying? Right. That might take six months. It might take a year. It might take two years. It might take, it might five. take five. <laughs> like, exactly. Um, but if you don't, if you're not doing it for the right reasons, it's any sane person a year into it or six months into it is going to pivot into something else. Yeah. When if you just really cared about it enough and you were in it for the right reasons and you just, you focused on the work, you, it'll come. Of course. You see what I'm saying? Like it'll, it'll come to you. And we see that we see many examples of this. So this is not, you know, this is not taboo stuff. You know, we've seen numerous examples of people who, even when they get to that point, people will look at them and think it's overnight and they tell you, nah, dude, like I've been, you know, mm-hmm. underground for the last six years, multiple, seven years. You we know have I mean? multiple examples yeah, of that. You know what I'm saying? Thousands of examples like that. Um, but I think we're, we live in a, we're in such an environment now where it's like everything has got to be right now. Oh, yeah. You see what I'm saying? And, and that'll weed out the people who don't really want to be here. So I don't really get too concerned with that. Because mm-hmm. my example of that is, yeah, we have a, the, the, the thing, the ones that actually matter have a long lasting impact. Like mm-hmm. people keep talking about in hip hop, oh, there's so many of these rant rappers out here that you know that are ruining hip hop, yada yada yada, whatever. Um, none of them sell records. You know who did sell records this year? Kendrick Lamar, mm-hmm. J. Cole, mm-hmm. Drake, uh, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like Nipsey Hustle, mm-hmm. the people that matter, J Rock, mm-hmm. uh, Pusha T, the people mm-hmm. who mattered, Nas, Nas, mm-hmm. Kanye, the people who matter sold records this year. You know what that means? That the people that matter are making an impact where it, it matters. Mm-hmm. So all that other stuff. Yeah, you know. you're gonna have people that right in and out. Um, it's funny you bring up albums, right? Takashi dropped an album, complete. Like, yeah, do people even realize that he dropped something? And the man's been running around for the last couple of months saying, "I'm, ch- I'm you know, Billboard this, Billboard that." So okay, so well. two things with Takashi, and hopefully we won't stay here too long. <laughs> <laughs> But one, it's gotten to a place where Takashi, you don't go to him for music anymore. You go to him for his antics. Very true. So there's Very true. that. Very true. And two, let's debunk this whole I'm 11 for 11 on Billboard myth that he has. It's not, well, it's not really a myth, but it's, it's inflated. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he's 11 for 11 on Billboard. But let's pay attention to where on Billboard he's placed. <laughs> it's not top 10 on Billboard and he's 11 for 11. It's like number 90 is one of them. Number 69 is one of them. Number 80 is one of them. Like, mm-hmm. let's pump the brakes here. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, he's 11 for 11 Billboard, but. Yeah. You know. It's 100. Billboard. Yeah, it's not It's not top 10. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. let's, let's pump the brakes. He maybe has one. In top ten, Fifi. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I don't. Right. I think he has one more from his recent album. That, but that's it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. People are easily fooled by that. Yeah, right? I'm all for mm-hmm. you know, you know, inflating the truth. I'm all for mm-hmm. it because he's still telling the truth. Mm-hmm. Hell, for a while, I didn't admit that I snuck backstage to interview Kendrick Lamar. I was mm-hmm. just telling people, hey, I can't interview Kendrick Lamar. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> that's all they so need I, to know. I is get the result. it. I get it. But like, like you know, I just I I. Mm-hmm. I ask people to do a little bit more than just listen to what people tell them. Mm-hmm. I have to tell friends that all the time. Don't listen to everything people tell you. I feel you. So you, so it's safe to say you, you love music. Oh, I love it. Um, that what, was, what are your favorite genres? Oh, uh, hip hop. I live, I am a living, breathing embodiment of hip hop. Okay. For sure. Um, how far back does it go? Let's see, what do we, what do we, man, let's take us back. Let's take you us from back. New York. Let's so we can go, back. we can, I, I can tell you, uh, the first rap song I ever heard. What was it? It was Woo Ha by Busta Rhymes. Oh, yeah. I remember that. I remember, I remember that. I remember the video, man. I the remember being classic. a kid, oh my God. seven years old, sitting in front of the TV, and it just BT just happened to be on. Mm-hmm. And and then it's just like overly animated, eccentric mm-hmm. dude is just like acting a fool in front of my eyes. And mm-hmm. I was like, what is this and how can I get more of it? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, nah. He changed the game with that one, man. He did, he bro. Was, oh, Hip- hip-hop to me, it's, it's, it's more than a lifestyle. It's more than the music you listen to. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's everyday life. Everything in my being is an embodiment of hip-hop. 
You know what I'm saying? Because hip hop has represented every aspect of my life from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether you want to talk about how uh, I said this earlier to you today about how Kanye, even though I had listened to hip hop years prior to Kanye, Kanye was the first person that represented me, a suburban kid, Mm -hmm. you know, from the middle of nowhere who had interests outside of just black interests. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to talk about Chance the Rapper, my father's a pastor. Mm -hmm. So now Chance the Rapper is more come from an aspect of being a Christian and holding on to your identity of being close to God. You know, or um, Jay-Z, who just basically is just a living embodiment of just being the best version of yourself and striving to do more and break more ground than you're given. Mm -hmm. Um, Tribe is is a living embodiment of individuality. Who you want to be, be that. It doesn't matter what anybody tells you was cool or not, because they came out in the time where it was nothing but gangster rappers. And you know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The people looking at them like, who are these corny dudes? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what I mean when I say I'm the living embodiment of hip hop Mm -hmm. is there's somebody who represents every aspect of my life that I can point to. Mm -hmm. What do you, what do you think about hip hop today? Um, And I say it from this perspective. You, me, having references of good music or what we consider to be good music, right? Because, you know, you put it in front of a 16 year old today, they don't they, they might be like, dude, I can't listen to that. You know, th- you know, give me some, you know, Kodak Black or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. It, it is music is subjective. Of course. You know, um, <laughs> but when you think about, you know, what it was back then and you look at it now, are you one of those people, especially with your platform, are you? the quote unquote hater of the new generation of music, or are you kind of seeing that it's, you know, this is what it's evolved into and you just kind of roll with it. Where do you stand with that? Well, it's interesting. You ask me this cause I have an argument about this all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, every few years we get the, I, 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 the sky is, we have someone who screams the sky is falling. And here's <laughs> what I mean by that. Every few years, we have somebody screaming, hip hop is dead. Oh, my God, it's the worst it's ever been. Ah, this is the worst rapper of all time. And then it keeps moving. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. In 1992, people thought MC Hammer was the end of hip hop. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? In 1989, people thought Kid and Play were the end of hip hop. In 19, in 1997, they thought Will Smith was going to be the end of hip hop. Mm-hmm. In 2006, they thought Laffy Taffy was going to be like it Mm -hmm, it happens mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens? We keep moving forward Mm -hmm. because I I guarantee you every era that you claim had trash rappers. We had great rappers that we still listen to to this day. Mm -hmm. So even now, if you want to talk if people who say that hip hop is worse now than it's ever been, you're clearly not listening Mm -hmm. because if you don't like Kodak Black, you can go to Joey Badass. Mm -hmm. If you don't like Takashi, you can go to Kendrick Lamar. If you Mm -hmm. don't like Louis Vert, you can go to J. Cole. Like Mm -hmm. Every person that you give me that you don't like, I can give you somebody that's just as popular, if not more popular, that you will like. Mm -hmm. So what are we talking about here? Mm -hmm. What are we complaining about here? Mm -hmm. I think the issue is we're not... Like, I'm 27, so in the age range of, like, 27 to 30, maybe 35, um, we're entering into into the territory of our parents of we don't recognize what made us fall in love with music anymore because Mm -hmm. it's a different time. It's evolved into something different. Mm -hmm. And so as opposed to us realizing that we're screaming out saying music isn't as good, Mm -hmm. when it is, it's just it's not for us. Agreed. Anymore. And even saying that, there is music for us. Mm -hmm. Like, Jay-Z and Beyonce just dropped an album. If you're married and got kids, that's an album just for you. If Mm -hmm. you're just a straight hip-hop head that loves bars and beats, Pusha T dropped an album for you this Mm -hmm. year. If you just want an album full of anthems and bangers, Nipsey Hussle dropped something for Mm -hmm. you this year. Mm -hmm. So... You know, something for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I don't necessarily subscribe to that whole idea that hip-hop is horrible now because... 
it's still great. It's just we held on to what made it great for us, what initially got us into it. And it's not that anymore. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's just not what it was that got it that made us fall in love with it in the first place. That's all. I think part of it, too, is when you look at the level of success that they have today, which is which is much higher Uh than those of the past who had who are considered more talented. Right. Um, And then you see these kids who have this level of success and they they they're not crediting the the OGs, if you want to call them that, right? Yeah. That you don't hear them really referencing, you know, those music. And I think part of it is where some people are looking at them like, hey man, you know, you should be a bit more appreciative. And they're feeling like, yo, y'all don't even like what we do. You see what Does I'm saying? That? Like it's like, why would we y'all not even rocking with us? Yeah. So it's like, you know, and then you have this generation, right? So now because then now there's this generation that does support their music, right? They they go to the shows. Mm-hmm. They go. It, it's as much. It's it's there. People. Somebody's going. Yeah. Somebody's going there. You see yeah, what I'm saying? It's yeah, a yeah. bunch of them going there, and you have all these kids that are gravitating to the music. Well, I I I, I feel like some of that is a bit of that jealousy mm-hmm. that's really at play here. Because like you said, the music evolves. If anything. Some of the stuff you see today is really kind of going back to where it was of before. Course. You see what I'm saying? Like they've taken pieces from the old stuff. Um, like you see, you brought up the Busta Rhymes. What I immediately thought of is J. Cole's uh, video. Um, what ATM. Was it? A- ATM. That was clearly a give me some like, more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yo, this reminds me of Bust. Yeah. So it's like, what are we, you know what I mean? What are we really trying to say? But and also, too, some of the backlash may come from, because I'm a. I'm a, a music historian, you know, mm-hmm. whether it's hip hop, r and I'm a music historian. Like, I like to go to the source. Mm-hmm. So, like, my favorite artist of all time is Stevie Wonder. Mm. So I can go if you want to if you want to go down the list of Motown, I can get I can name I can sing you uh, Stevie Wonder, Temptations, Marvin Gaye, Sam Cooke, Al Green, mm. uh, Supremes. Jackson Five, like Four Tops, uh, Isley Brothers, OJ's. Like I can go there with you if you want to go there. But you know what happens when I go there? My uncles and my and my dad and my aunties are like, what you know about that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Don't we you think do that's that. a little bit counterproductive? Because mm-hmm. if I don't know anything about that, you're gonna mm-hmm. be like, oh, y'all don't know good music. Mm-hmm. But I do know good music. I do mm-hmm. my history. I do my research, and you still shit on me for it. Mm-hmm. There's it's no win win. Like I still get that all the time. Like the other day, my uncle he played um Mama Used to Say by Junior. Mm-hmm. And that's a, for people who don't know, that's a Mama Used to Say, Take Your Time, Young Man. And I was singing that when he was playing it, and he was like, You don't know nothing about this. I'm like, Mm-hmm. Can't win. <laughs> Can't win. So what? Can't so win like, losing. so am I gonna so I feel like that happened a lot. To mm-hmm. younger generations too, like a lot of older generations, kind of pushed us to the side. Of like y'all don't know nothing about mm-hmm. real music, or y'all don't know nothing about this. Or, Go over in the corner and play. So what happened was we went over in the corner and played and created our own thing, and now it's the thing that's popular. And you mad mm-hmm. when you could have been having your arm around us, shepherding us through this to the next generation and being hand in hand with us like they did in older generations. Mm-hmm. But you chose not to do that, and now you mad. Mm-hmm. I have no sympathy for that. No, I, I agree, man. I, dude, I just even I remember, you know, the the old school at noon. Right. Mm-hmm. I remember driving around in my car and when that thing came on. I'm like, man, popping a cassette, you know, pop it like I wasn't trying to listen to that. I yeah. waited till one o'clock. I'm like, I try to listen to it. I'm like, man, I ain't trying to hear this stuff. <laughs> so I could imagine, you know, what I mean, it's like, let's not act like when the music we were listening to growing up. Like the people older than us wanted to hear that. Yeah, you see what I'm saying. But it's, and but it's it, full circle to me. It's I've been blessed to have people in my life that constantly were mentors in multiple different ways. Like I like when I was younger, my cousin Trayvon lived with us, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember, I remember the exact day that hip hop became my everything. I can remember the exact mm-hmm. day I was in my room. Now remember, people, I, I gave the caveat earlier that there's not a lot of black people where I'm from, mm-hmm. so a lot of my babysitters were white. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my early influence were like country music, pop music, you know what I'm saying? So I remember one day he comes in my room and I'm listening to a CD and he's like, what are you listening to? I said, oh, I'm listening to NSYNC. Mm-hmm. When I tell you he popped over my CD player, broke it, <laughs> broke the CD right in front of me. 
and then put in a tribe called Quest Love Movement and said, you're not leaving this room till you listen to every song on this CD. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. and I listened to it. And that was the first tribe CD. At first, like it was, I listened to a full through and I'm sitting there like mind blown after that. And I go in his room after them. I was like, what else do you have for me? And that's when I started, he started teaching me about Snoop Dogg, mm. No Limit, mm. UGK, Nas, Jay-Z, Biggie, Pac. Like, he gave me a history lesson, like, from there and on. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I do recognize not a lot of people have that. Mm-hmm. But that goes back to what I was saying earlier about a lot of people were kind of meandering through the desert on their own, had no guidance. Mm-hmm. So you can't really be mad at the product. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I agree. Yeah, my oldest sister is the one who did it for me. Yeah. She used to listen to LL, Raekwon, right. Wu-Tang. And I used to just, I used to just kind of just like, yo, let me listen. Yeah. You know, she used to put, she used to be like, yo, here, listen to this song. So you're right. If, and, and in turn, I did it for my younger sister. I was the one that was like, yo, listen to this. She would hear me listen to it. So then she's listening mm-hmm. to it, you know, and then so forth. And so, like you said, it's a lot of it is passed down. Um, so we can't, you know, can't be mad at the, the new school. You it, can't, it is, man. And I, but I, but I'd be lying if I said that I didn't have a point in time where I did kind of oh, feel yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah. But you got to grow out of that, you know mm-hmm, what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. like, it just realized that it's a lot of just talking in the air that doesn't really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my sister kind of put me on, yeah. you know, to a lot of the music, and I in turn put my younger sister on the music, and she put on my cousins to music. Yeah. And, it just kind of passed on. Um, but yeah, you, you was uh, the album of the year. I, you have Nipsey. And yeah. And a lot of people was talking about Drake. and Ain't Nobody around me is talking about Drake. I'll tell you that for sure. Uh, everybody around me is talking about Nipsey Hussle got album of the year. <laughs> I'm like, what is the criteria anymore? It's like. See, we can get into can you, that. Yeah. What is, we can like, get into what, that. What's your criteria for it? So it has to be something that, that lasts. Especially now, because mm-hmm. we have like Music we had we had certain weeks where there were allowed eleven albums dropping that same day. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So there's mm-hmm. a lot. So one, you got to be able to last the test of time. That album came out in February. Mm-hmm. I still, I was listening to it earlier today, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it came out last in February. Check. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <Bro>. like, <laughs> like, and also too. Here's why I love it so much. I feel like it's an album that you can play it. It, it could have came out in any era of hip hop. Agreed. And it would have still like it reminds me when I listen to Last Time That I Checked or Rap Niggas mm-hmm. or Hustle and Motivate, I feel like I'm like in 2003. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's a weird like because that's that was like the era of the rap anthems. Like every single was like this big, larger than life song. And Nipsey got like five of them on that album. Mm-hmm. And then you got introspective records like Real Big, mm-hmm. you know, which is probably my favorite song on the album. So as of right now, or even like him going back and getting Diddy on on, you know, Young G's like mm-hmm. it's it's an instant classic. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to call it that, you mm-hmm. know, and we don't have a lot of that in this era. Mm-hmm. Um, the last instant classic. I can think of prior to Victory Lap is maybe Good Kid, Mad City. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it hasn't been an album that at the minute I listen to it, I'm like, oh, this is classic. Mm-hmm. Hands down. Mm-hmm. Nah, um, Royce Royce had a good little He did. Good he, he did. It's, like um, it's definitely up there. It's definitely up there for albums of the year. Like, if we were talking top 10, top 15, it's definitely up there. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But Nipsey's number one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he, 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 he got the co-sign from so many people, you know, and again, it's, it's documented, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of the grind. And I think people, a lot of these guys grind, but you know, when you can kind of see it, it was almost like he was due. You know what yeah, I'm saying? that makes like perfect it's, sense. It's, it's like, yo, you, you, you're due. That makes perfect one. sense. Um, a lot of people came and went, a lot of people had, you know, different successes and, you know, Ross and just a bunch of people. He was due mm-hmm. and um, he delivered. It wasn't like, you know, again, it's not like the album was mediocre. Oh, no. And we're just saying, well, he's just been grinding. So let's no. And the music was good. Mm-hmm. You know, it's good. And so um, now I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. I think it I think it also, like you said, you got to be able to play it still. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying to myself, like, who that uh, what are you playing on Scorpion? <laughs> And don't tell me you play inside me. Like oh it's like, God. what are we playing? I, I will so, say this: I've grown to like it more because initially, when I first listened to it, I was like, "Get this out of here." But mm-hmm. I've grown to like it more. But 
as a I'm a I'm a Drake fan. <laughs> yeah, bro, I'm, I'm a Drake fan. Drake so as a Drake fan, well, even if I'm a fan of any artist, I always compare it to their previous work. Mm-hmm. I do this with everybody. It's not just Drake. But Scorpion is like, like I said, it's like his fifth best album, maybe. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I would take Take Care over it. I would take Nothing Was the Same over it. Agreed. I would take If You're Reading This Is Too Late over <sighs> it. I would take So Far Gone over. So what are we talking so about here? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I can't. So for me, I can't wait Scorpion mm-hmm. that that hard. Mm-hmm. I just can't. That's just me, though. Mm-hmm. Be, being a media personality, right? Mm-hmm. What? How are you comfortable with putting yourself out there? Because I'm sure a lot of people, what might be holding them back from getting into certain things, whether it be a podcast, maybe YouTube, um, acting Mm -hmm. even, you know, just putting themselves out there, um, potentially falling, you know, on their face in front of people. What motivates you or what what keeps you going to where it's like, you know, what, I'm going to I'm just going to roll with it, put it out there. I, I may get a great response. I may get a bad response that could happen. But you still stick with it. Um, I attribute that to my college theater director. Um, have you ever seen Whiplash? Yeah. Okay. So imagine uh that teacher in Whiplash mm-hmm. is my theater director. <laughs> um the man was crazy. It's a good movie too. The, a great movie, <laughs> one of my favorites, but the man was insane. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh you know, when I got to college, I thought I was I thought I was the man. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I had I had finally started getting some lead roles out on the tail end of my career, high school career as an actor. So I was, you know, I was I was nominated for awards. I even won some, and um, I even had the Texas state record for most recruitments for an actor. Um, we did this. I did this thing at International Thespian Society, which is a, a yearly conference for uh the texas chapter Mm -hmm. and my senior year i auditioned it's kind of like you know what you do is you do a two-minute monologue in front of like 30 like 30 different schools okay and there's representatives from everywhere like nyu ut usc like everywhere every major film school or theater department at a major university is there in that room and you perform a two-minute monologue and if they like you they recruit you and mm-hmm. they basically tell you this is how much we'll offer you to come be at our school. And I did that and I had 20 recruitments. And that was the most in state history at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, until my homegirl beat me a year later with 21. But, you know, <laughs> that just shows you that. that just, but that just shows you how good we were. Mm-hmm. I can't. I come from a small town, but they bred us mm-hmm. right. They mm-hmm. they taught us the way they need to teach us. So I came into college. I was, I was feeling myself. You know, I was the man. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And... The minute I walked into the first day of school, my first day in my theater class, like I think my biggest role prior to that was I was John Proctor in The Crucible. Okay. Uh, I won a few awards for that. That was my biggest role today, and my college director knew that. Mm -hmm. So I walked into class like a few minutes late. It was like, whatever, it's a few minutes late, whatever. Mm -hmm. The minute I walk into class, my theater director's like, oh, look, John Proctor decides to show up. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. Mm Put you right on the spot. <laughs> I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and for the next two years, he made my life a living hell. <laughs> I mean, throwing chairs at me. <laughs> he threatened to strangle me. Like I remember, <clears throat> uh, there was a there was there was a faulty like we were, I was supposed to open this door on set and it was broken and I when I finally got open it busted my lip and I'm like mm. bleeding everywhere and I stopped acting in the middle of the scene. He flipped out he was like just don't you ever stop a scene no one says cut but me i swear to god if you ever cut a scene outside of my permission ever again you will never act for me ever again a day in your life like just flipping out over everything and and even i think even the craziest thing he told me like i auditioned for a play and i auditioned for the lead Everybody thought I should have got the lead. Everybody was like, oh, Josh killed it. He got it. I didn't get the lead. And everybody was like, why didn't Josh get it? And he says, uh, he's not the leading man type. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I had never, like, no, Yo. <laughs> no one has ever, no one ever treated me like that. Mm-hmm. Like, he made me feel less than human. Mm-hmm. And when I graduated from college, we had a long talk. Because by that time, I was done. I was like, 
fuck this dude. Like I'm just like, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. I, I just, you know, sorry, mom, if I'm cussing, it's just, I just, mm-hmm. I just had to, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, I was just done when we had an argument and it was like my last week of school. So at that time I was like, I don't got to put up with you anymore. And I walked out and I was like, I'm done. I'm out of here. So he found me on campus, like a few days for graduation. It was like, I need to talk to you. I was like, okay. He says to me, Josh, are you not the most reliable and one of the most talented people I have in my department. And I said to him, I don't know, because from the day I got here, you've treated me like I'm less than human. And he proceeded to tell me, like, there's only a select few people that I see every year that I know want to take this to another level. You were one of those people. And so I needed to prepare you for what you were about to get yourself into. Mm. I needed to show you that the world that you're about to go into doesn't care about your feelings. Mm -hmm. They don't care about what you think of yourself. They don't care about anything that goes on with you. All they care about is results and what you can provide to them. And that's what I needed to prepare you for. He's true. And it blew my mind when he told me that, and it made sense. Mm -hmm. Everything made sense after that because everything he did made me tougher. Mm -hmm. Everything he did made me like, gave me like, made me like more willing to deal with what people have to say about me and to where it doesn't even affect me anymore. Cause now nothing anybody can say about me affects me. Nothing. Mm -hmm. And he, he built that. Instilled that. Yeah. So I think that's where it comes from, man. It's just like, I had someone who who literally taught me that whatever anybody has to say about me literally doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. What do you want? What mm-hmm. do you want to do? What do you want to say? That's what's important. Mm-hmm. Have you have you gotten I'm sure you've gotten we've all gotten even if you have the the greatest of intentions, there's always that one person that comes along that's like either over critiquing you or criticizing you or just make a negative comment um and hopefully you you look past it. You keep you keep moving. Um, but do you have do you get moments like that where all, it could be in social media mm-hmm. um, where, you know, you may put out again, you put out a lot of different content that somebody just says something really ignorant. Yeah. Um, and you don't you don't necessarily have to get into all those things. But I'm just trying to get into does it happen? Mm-hmm. And if it does happen, um, how do you not stay in that moment? Well, yes, it does still happen, um, mainly because I don't keep people around me who aren't going to be completely honest with me and tell me what I need to hear. Um, yes, men do not exist around me. In my circle, non-existent. We're going to tell each other what we really think about things, and we're going to get a real reaction and a real response to how we feel about things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same with me. Like I'm completely honest with everybody around me about everything, and that's just how it has to be. If you get your feelings hurt, like dust it off your shoulder and keep it moving. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, so yes, it still happens. And, um, in again, like, I, like I said, like I'm kind of at a place now where it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really affect me. It lets me know what I need to improve upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and nine times out of 10, I'm my worst critic. I can tell it's trash before you can tell me it's trash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like I'm going to be able to catch it before you are. Mm-hmm. By the time I'm ready to put something out, like I, I, I have my, you know, I'm mm-hmm. fully behind it and I believe in it. Mm-hmm. So um, it does still happen. And when it does happen, it doesn't keep me down really at all. Cause I understand where it's coming from. You want me to be great. Cause you believe I can be great. Mm-hmm. So no. Nah. How do you, how do you juggle all the things um, that you are doing? Because it's, it's, it's one thing to be doing different things. It's another thing to be doing different things. Well, right. right. Um, and you've managed to, to, to give, each of those areas, some level of attention where, you know, people can look at it and, and respect it. So I'm, I'm sure there's something that goes into that. How are you able to balance those things and not simply, like you said, maybe veer off in one direction or the other? Or even, not to digress, but a lot of times you get people that say, hey, focus on one thing. Yeah. Don't. But you, you're you managing to do all these things. So how do you manage to keep up with it? Um. Because I genuinely, I don't move unless I genuinely want to move. I don't put my hands into something unless I'm passionate about it and I genuinely want to do it. There's nothing I do just to do it. 
or just a, oh it'll be cool if I put this on my resume or oh this would be a good look if I get seen over here doing this nah if I'm doing something I want to do it mm-hmm. and so there's a certain level of passion each thing I do gets because I want to do it um and I'm a firm believer in anything you truly want you'll make time for agreed um so Everything that I everything that I do gets the same level of commitment and passion because it's what I want to do and I make time for it. There's ways to do it. Like I know everybody says it's only 24 hours in a day and half of that time or like eight hours of that time if eight hours is spent sleeping. So, um, you know, it's and I and I agree it's hard to get a lot done and accomplished. But if you really want to do it, you won't make excuses for it. You'll just get it done. Um, Like we were talking earlier about how when I had the premiere for matters of the heart, a lot of people came up to me and say, man, I've been wanting to do this for a while. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, man, I have so many scripts that I've written that I would love to get made into something. And I genuinely don't have it in my brain. The the idea of not getting something done. Mm-hmm. Like it's, 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 it's impossible. Like the idea of not doing something, it just doesn't register in my head for some reason. Mm-hmm. And I think it came from my mom. Um, my mom, when I was a kid, I came into her room with this list, right? And it was a list of every job I wanted when I grew up. I was a kid. I didn't mm-hmm. know what I was talking about. So I had every job imaginable on it, like mm-hmm. actor, doctor, lawyer, uh, football star, basketball player, like everything in the world mm-hmm. that you could be was on this list. And she looked at me and she said, you know what? If you actually, if you actually work at it, you can be all these things if you want to. Mm. And I really think that's where it, it that mentality came from me is like mm-hmm. obviously I know I can't be all of those right, things, right, right. but like anything At that I'm good in all of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, well, good. Uh, yeah, that's a good Most point. Time, right. <laughs> but I think that's where it started in me, where it's just like the idea of not doing something just doesn't register to me. Like when people tell me I w- I would have loved to have been this, I just it just didn't happen for me. Like that, there's no way to make that make sense in my mind. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna ask you this. Because I think this is a real, this is a real question, mm-hmm. um, especially with the amount of attention that I'm sure you receive because of the various avenues that you're in, the podcast being, uh, you know, really successful, um, especially being in a Dallas area where mm-hmm. not a lot of people are doing similar things. And so you here you are now, you're standing out, you got the films, you're doing things, you're networking. How do you... How do you filter the negative people in your life, right, from the the good people that should stick around? Mm -hmm. And then also, again, as a brother, (laughs) you know, this is called what it is. Women are attracted to dudes that are doing good things. This is called what it is. Um, You talked about the breakup earlier. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're in a different space now. That was a long time ago. Um, How do you... How do you not get caught up in that? Okay. Right? Because that's that, a can, very good that can stop you from that's doing a, a lot question. of things. So how do you not get caught up in that? Well, one, the filtering negative people out of your life mm-hmm. is um I'm twenty again, I keep saying it now because people think I'm way older. So I gotta mm-hmm. let people know I'm only twenty seven people. Mm-hmm. Uh the filtering as I've gotten older. I mean, when you're in high school, you want every friend you can have. Mm-hmm. Like as it's funny when we're younger. We want everybody in our school to like us. Mm -hmm. And at one point in time, that was my goal. Like I even became homecoming king when I when I was a senior in high school. Like my goal in high school was to get everybody to love me. Mm -hmm. Um, The older you get, you don't want all of that around you. You only want the people that that really add something to your life around you at all times. Great. And when you get even older you start noticing how this person affects you as opposed to how this other person affects you and it's only so many times this other person can start affecting you negatively before you realize maybe it's best i don't have you around as much true so i mean my show is called don't take it personal for a reason Mm -hmm. i don't really care if it hurts your feelings if i have to do something that's best for me Mm-hmm. I really don't mm-hmm. because at the end of the day, I got to go home and look at myself in the mirror. You don't. Correct. So whatever you got to do, and this is a message to everybody listening, whatever you have to do for the best interest of yourself, do it. 
without without worrying about how other people are going to be affected by it or if it's going to hurt their feelings or if they're going to feel like you didn't changed up on them change up mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. whatever works best for you if it means changing up and cutting this person out of your life do that now for the second part of your question mm-hmm. uh the woman aspect um I'm weird when it comes to relationships. And what I mean by this is I will admit that um, I was scorned by my relationship that spawned matters of the heart. I was scorned by that. Um, And what I mean by that is it's made me pay more attention to the women I allow in my life. Uh, I'm around beautiful women every day because of what I do beauty doesn't phase me like i don't even follow beautiful women on social media like i feel like you get i feel like what helps me save time is not following a bunch of beautiful women on instagram because Mm -hmm. i will get caught up in that i'm a man Mm -hmm. it happens Mm -hmm. so i purposely avoid certain things like that um just so i can stay focused but um so now when it comes to dealing with women i only deal with women that bring something of significance to my life so if we have a genuine connection Mm -hmm. if i can have a conversation with you if if you pique my interest then i'll take it a step further but for you to stick around you have to actually add to my life as opposed to subtract from it if it gets to a place where i feel like what i'm working towards is not getting as much as much attention as it should because i'm because i'm dealing with you then that becomes a problem and I will make that sacrifice. And I have made that sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've also dealt with women who have added to what I was doing. They've actually, uh, they've actually assisted me in certain ways and gave me ideas on how to improve. Mm -hmm. Um, But just the relationship didn't work out. So I'm not opposed to being with women. I'm Mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Um, But you have to add something to my life as opposed to take away from it. If that makes sense. I agree. Especially, especially with, you know, when you're doing things, Mm -hmm. right. Um, and you're building something. Yeah. Because it's one thing to build it, even when you get there. You know, they say even when you get to the top of the mountain, you realize, you know, you got to climb another mountain. Mm-hmm. Right. So some people don't even stay there. Right. You know, they just they're looking for the next opportunity. Right. So we, we kind of end up repeating this process of I'm, I'm trying to build something else yeah. now. And so the person in your life, your, your, you know, your partner, you know, that's your partner in crime. You you want the, their support. But usually what, anything that you want to put your heart towards is going to require time Mm. and sacrifice. Lots Um, of sacrifice. Exactly. Those, they go hand in hand. You cannot, you you just can't, you can't do, you can't not have one without the other. And so not a lot of people you come across, um, can accept that. Right. Right. Because, and, and and selfishly, I, I understand, right. Because you come into a picture and you, you know, you come into a situation and, and you want time. You want attention, right? Or else why you, you know, you feel like why you're here. Right. But um, it's also important, right? Hopefully you find the right person who finds a way to create the attention that they right. want, if that makes and sense. And and here's the thing. It's been proven to me. I'm, mm-hmm. I, I can say it's been proven. There have been women so, in my life who have found ways for us to find time for each other and not take away from what I was doing. Mm-hmm. It happens. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like... I hate to to debunk the myth, fellas. I'm probably telling too much for all the women listening, but you know, no matter how busy we are as men, like if for the right woman, there's time to be made for them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it's it's, it's been proven. What's the, what's the saying? You it's not that you you make time. No, you find you don't find time. You make time. Mm-hmm. It's a difference, yeah. right? Because you, you're never gonna find like people. We're always gonna be busy doing something. We right. always got something going on, right? Hopefully, you got something going on. But you will create the time, you know, to take care of things that you feel is important enough. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, you know, how does that that person has to kind of get to that level of being that uh, important to where they can be a priority right. there. But in the beginning, it's like, yo, I got to, you know, I got to get this thing going. You mm-hmm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you and get in where you fit in. <laughs> and, and part of like, that comes from. I mean, if we're going to be all the way real Mm -hmm. here and this is what we're doing and I get a lot of flack for this point of view, but I think it's because a lot of people don't want to be a lot of people don't want to feel like they're not good people or that they're not selfish. 
a lot of people want to feel like they're they're just all around perfect people and i get that cool bravo you know what i'm mm-hmm. saying but if we're going to be real here no woman wants a man that doesn't have it together yet mm-hmm. my experience i've realized a woman doesn't want a man who doesn't have it figured out yet or doesn't have a thing going and what we're doing is chasing a dream mm-hmm. that's the simplest way i can put it is mm-hmm. we're chasing a dream mm-hmm. and a lot of women unfortunately don't want to deal with a dude that doesn't have it together yet mm-hmm. A lot of women are probably screaming at the phone right now. Like, you don't know what you're talking about, Jay. But I can only do (laughs) whether you want it, whether you want to admit it or not. It's cool. I don't really care if you do or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have you don't have really have to. You can act like you don't you don't, you know, Mm -hmm. agree with me, but that's fine. Um, But really, all I can do is speak from my personal experiences Mm -hmm. and from my personal experiences i've there's been times where i didn't have it together there's been times where i've been low and and didn't know girls want to deal with that Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and then there's been times where i've been up been really up i would consider myself in an upswing right now Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and that's i'm more attractive past just the physical but i'm more attractive now than i've been in previous moments because i got it more together now Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. what i'm saying Mm -hmm. so but i'm cognizant of that i'm Mm -hmm. not stupid Mm -hmm. and i'm not oblivious to the fact that women want security Mm -hmm. and if i can't offer you that i'm not going to waste your time right and and dude i even take it even further i'll be blunt about it if you don't have stuff together your stuff together meaning you can be able to provide for yourself Mm -hmm. whatever that may be so i'm not saying you got to have 10 cars or you got a mansion or a house i'm not i'm not i'm not even going that far i'm saying you can take care of yourself Mm -hmm. whatever that means whether that means you know you can buy yourself nice clothes or take care of yourself physically or you know your bills are paid whatever that may be if you don't have that together you should not even be dealing <laughs> seriously Agreed. seriously with any woman seriously you can you know it's whatever right. you know what i mean <laughs> like you you know you 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 know it in your head you know you ain't got together if she still want to deal with you you probably it's not going to be that set don't have any heavy expectations mm-hmm. don't be don't be thinking too far ahead because if you don't here's here's what could happen right yeah. <laughs> You go into that situation, stuff now still, it's not figured out. She's like, cool. A couple months later, your stuff's still not figuring out. We a year, two years, whatever the case may be. After a while, they lose respect for you, baby. Mm-hmm. Let's just call it what it is. They lose respect for you. I agree. And and me, you know, and people tell me this all the time. They say I treat relationships like business sometimes, but I feel like they are to an extent. Yeah. Uh, it's like if I... I feel like I try to avoid all of that from possibly happening. I'm trying to avoid the possibility of me being put in a position where you lose respect for me or you don't see me as the man in the relationship. Mm -hmm. And, and statistics show the minute a woman stops feeling, stops respecting you, the relationship is pretty much gone. Yeah. And so I just don't put myself in situations that I feel are going to get to that place. And I just don't, I, I feel like I spend so much of my time, I've tried so hard not to get my own time wasted. I'm not going to waste anybody right. else's. Right. So that's just, you know. I agree a thousand percent. Man. Yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, some, that's some game for you guys out there, man. If y'all listening, man, it's real talk. Don't do not do it to yourself. Yeah. I just. You're going to end up hurt in yeah, the process. Man. Cause, and it's the same yeah. thing, but and it's, and it's unfortunate for some women because some of these dudes are just tricky out here, man. I had mm-hmm. one of my homegirls tell me the other day. Like this dude had been courting her for a while, a long while, asked her to be his girl three different times. Like she turned him down three different times just because she was like she didn't know if he was actually serious. Mm -hmm. But he kept coming back. He's persistent. She finally was like, yes, I like you and I want to be with you. The minute she said yes, she ain't hear from him for two weeks. (laughs) The minute I'm like, I don't. And I was I was perplexed because I'm like, dog, he went through so much just to not even. And so, and yeah. that would infuriate Guys me. What they want. Yeah, and that would infuriate me because I'm a guy that doesn't like to waste his time. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I, that would infuriate me. So mm-hmm. I, I sympathize with women, man. I do. Mm-hmm. Nah, I feel you, man. Um, I want to talk about the, co- like, how is it collaborating with people, right? Especially being out here in Dallas. Um, I'm sure you, you know, working with different people. You mentioned uh, KG earlier. You know, as somebody who's been with you mm-hmm. when you've gone to certain things. 
but just in terms of like i'm just curious like in terms of collaborating yeah uh with people i'm sure you i'm sure you didn't do the film entirely like by yourself oh, of course you, right so <laughs> I, I would assume there's people so how was it um you know collaborating with people on that level and then also i'm curious as to what is your process for having guests on your podcast okay uh as far as collaborating goes um you know i'm a master researcher so i pay attention to like everything and you know being being in this industry as long as i have you meet you meet people you know so whether it's like uh sound people camera people you know grips you know just just you meet you meet these people they're around because you're in that industry and you just keep a mental tab of all of these people. So whenever you want to do something, you pay attention to what they've done, their experience and what they can offer. And then when the time is right, then you you reach out to them. It's, it's so uh, like, for example, uh, I keep a mental tab of everything. So I'm I'm hearing your I'm hearing your place. I'm seeing all this equipment. I'm seeing all the attention to detail you you have to everything like I'm keeping mental note of all of that. And so down the line, if I need if I need someone like you for a particular thing, I know I have you. Mm -hmm. So. I guess my like I, my thing is like I. I I hate auditions mm -hmm. because I feel like auditions are similar to job interviews. You're presenting your best self. Right. So that you get the part or you get the position. Right. Just just for you to slack off later. Mm -hmm. I pay attention when you don't think I'm paying attention. Mm -hmm. I'm watching you when you don't think anybody's watching you so that I know how you are when you're, the spotlight isn't on you. So I know when the spotlight is on you, you'll perform. Mm -hmm. So for Matters of the Heart, like just to go back to Matters of the Heart, I didn't audition anybody for that. Everybody that I picked were people that I've been keeping an eye on previous to that. Mm -hmm. Um so I didn't have to audition them. I knew I knew what they could do. I knew what they could bring to the table. And it's the same thing as far as collaborating when it comes to any and everything I do. I'm paying attention to you when you don't think I'm paying attention so that when I'm ready to do something, I know who I can call. Right. So I guess that's just that's just a note for everybody listening. One of my high school theater teacher taught me you're always on audition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when you see the way I move on social Never media, watching. Yeah, yeah, when you see the way I move on social media, when you see the way I move when I'm on a stage, when I'm in front of a room full of people, when I'm interacting with everybody, I'm not I'm not like putting on a front. That's who I am. But mm -hmm. I'm cognizant of how I'm presenting myself at all times. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, you know, what I would tell people, just be cognizant of what you're doing at all times, because somebody's watching even when you don't think they are. Mm -hmm. So that's how it comes for me when it comes to collaboration. Now, as, as far as the other, what was the other the part? podcast? The podcast. Like how do you? Oh, how do, how do I go you? about getting guests? Mm -hmm. Um, kind of the same thing because um, when I did live from the underground, there would be people that I met that had like crazy personality. They, they mm -hmm. have hour long conversations with them, but the minute you put a microphone in front of them, oh, they yeah, freeze. freeze up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I've what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so when it came to the don't take it personal. Life from Underground was for the city. It was for Dallas. It was for underground hip hop. It was for people to shine. Because at one point in time, K104 or 97.9 The Beat weren't letting Dallas rappers on their show. Mm. So we were like the the breakfast club for Dallas hip hop for, for a good while. Like if you release an album or you release a song, we would play your song on the radio and we would interview you. We have fun. Like mm -hmm. it was a great environment. I'm not doing nobody no favors with don't take a personal. I don't owe y'all nothing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, feel you. I don't I feel owe you. you a thing with don't take a personal. Mm -hmm. Like I have people who want to come on my show all the time and I tell them no, because we're not here to promote your project. One, mm -hmm. sorry, this is not what we do here. And two, I don't know if you can perform, like if you could perform to the level I need you to perform on. Cause when you're in the, if you listen to our podcast, mm -hmm. it's a room full of strong personalities. When mm -hmm. you get in, the, when you get in that room and you get on that mic, you got to be able to hold your own with me mm -hmm. and my co host And that's mm -hmm. a hard, to, and that's a tough act to follow. Mm -hmm. So I got to be sure that you can do that. Mm -hmm. So I watch your previous interviews. I watch how you interact with people like just out and about. I watch mm -hmm. how you are online. And if I feel like you can't hack it, you can't come on. Mm -hmm. Real talk. That's just how it is. Like, <laughs> it's real talk. I've had plenty, like, because I just, I've had plenty of people come on live from the underground and they just freeze when a microphone is in front of their mm -hmm. face. And I'm not having that. That don't take it personal. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. 
because I don't care and you don't take it personal. Like it's mm-hmm. a, like one thing I love about doing so many different things is I have a different attitude towards everything. Gotcha. The attitude I have towards the podcast is not the attitude I have towards my filmmaking and, and acting mm-hmm. or towards any, all the other things I do. I have different, you know, like I admire Nick Cannon for that. Nick mm-hmm. Cannon is somebody who can host America's Got Talent and then turn around and do Wildin' Out. Wildin out. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I admire people like that. And that's kind of how I am. It's just like, I can be this way here because this is what this requires, but I can be a totally different person here because this is what this requires. And mm-hmm. that's just kind of how I model myself. Take me, because I'm sure that it probably happened that first where you did have that guest on, you don't got to say who, but you, you probably had somebody on and then you realize like, yeah, this person probably, it probably wasn't for them. Yeah. And then, you know, you learn from that moving forward. Um, but was there a moment like that? Did, can, oh, can yeah. You think of, okay. Um, like more so in Life on Instagram, but I have had a few of those moments and don't take mm-hmm. it personal. And I would just say pay attention to the people who haven't been back because there's a few repeat guests. Like there's a few people who've come on multiple times. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's a few times there's only one time you see them, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then they don't come back, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's just, I have definitely had that and I just like show and prove. So if it does happen, mm-hmm. I just pay more attention to who I'm bringing on next. That's all. Mm-hmm. What's the, what's the next chapter, um, for you in regards to just the things that you're doing? Um, clearly we know with the movies, you mentioned Sundance, you mentioned, course. you know, with that. So we, we, we kind of see yeah. where that's going. Right. Um, where do you see the other stuff going? Yeah. So obviously Hollywood is my main focus. Mm-hmm. Like I'm doing media to pass the time while I'm doing everything else, because there's a lot of time that goes into writing a script, casting the project, getting a crew together actually getting it done that takes a lot of time and then the editing process Mm -hmm. don't get me started on the editing Mm -hmm. process Mm -hmm. uh you know what i mean there's a lot of time that goes into these things um so everything i do in media is meant to pass the time in between then um so if i so for people who are probably wondering what's your main what's like what's your end goal what do you want at the end of this just to be um an actor filmmaker who has the opportunity to create his own projects and kind of move at his own pace control. That's, that's my end goal until then Mm -hmm. I'm going to be doing media. So I'm currently doing, don't take a personal, uh, two year anniversary is coming up. Um, but I also have a few other shows I'm doing this year. Uh, so I got a film review show coming out soon. Nice. Um, an album review show amongst other things we'll talk about on that show, but album review show and then uh, a relationship podcast. Mm. Um, so it'd be me and Hollywood cast and uh, these two, uh, two other ladies, which all of this is it's unannounced. A lot of opinions. Yeah. There's a, a lot of opinions in one But, but we have a great community. We have a great, we, we work really well together. They've mm-hmm. been on our show a couple of times. Okay. So everything will be announced soon. This is the first time I've actually said any of this nice. out loud. So nice. I'm giving you the exclusive. Hey, I haven't exclusive. even explained. I haven't even explained who the partner is yet. So, mm-hmm. so that's all up. It's, it's coming. Okay. Okay. Um, but I'm going to be way more active this year. You know, when I was, when I first moved here, the first five years, I was doing a different event damn near every night. And I got exhausted. Like after that, after I stopped doing live from the underground, I was exhausted. I was like, I need a mental break from all of my responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of retreated a little bit. People weren't seeing as much as me for a while. Like I'd be out and about every now and then, but for the most part, I kind of kept to myself because I needed to get myself back. I had to remember why I was doing all of this for in the first place. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I've taken that time and I'm recharged, I'm rejuvenated and I'm ready to go a lot harder. So I'm going to be going harder with Don't Take It Personal and as long as much as as well as with the other shows I was talking about. Um, but um, the main thing are these films. That's like mm-hmm. the main thing. I'm so excited about what we're doing with them. I'm so excited because of, of the possibilities of where they can go and what it can do for us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's been my dream since I was 10 years old, since I stood on that stage playing Jesus Christ mm-hmm. um, and saw that crowd giving me a standing ovation, you know, 
I started seeing myself at the Oscars, mm-hmm. you know, and that's where my head is at. All this other stuff is fun. I, the media stuff I do for fun. I want mm-hmm. that. I don't want people to think I don't care about that because I do. But in the grand scheme of things, that's what I do for fun. Gotcha. And I think that's why I'm so successful at it is because I'm just. Yeah, you enjoy doing I mean, it. I enjoy it doing like it. Work, you know, yeah. It felt hard. You wouldn't want to do it. Yeah, you know, you I enjoy wouldn't, it. wouldn't last this long. Yeah, mm-hmm. I enjoy it. So that mm-hmm. I think that's why I'm so successful at it. Mm-hmm. But my main thing is where I'm going when it comes to Hollywood. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And I, I just see it vividly. I meditate every day. That's what's up. So I see where it's going and I see where I, I see where it's going to end up. And I'm I'm very excited about that. Okay. I'm gonna give you some this is a, a segment that I try to put into each episode, man, some rapid fire questions. Okay. Um and so I'm going to, not questions, I'm sorry. I'm going to mention some words to you. I'm going to mention a word to you. Okay. And you reply back with the first thing that comes to your mind. It could be a person or it can be um, a phrase, right? Let's start off with some uh, family. Mm. Uh, love. Social media. Anxiety. <laughs> Music. Happiness. Movies. Fantasy. Friends. Heart. Dallas. I know people are going to be mad about this, but people back in Big Spring, but home. Nice. Nice. Um, Travel. Untapped. I definitely haven't traveled as much as I should. Mm. Okay. 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 So that, that that's all the 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 words there. Um, why haven't you traveled as much? Um, Busy? when you when you do radio, gotcha. You know, you everything's kind of planted. Yeah, it's hard to just yeah uproot and just you know. So um, but I've got I've gotten better about it. Like I went to L.A. for the first time in April for my birthday. Uh, one of my younger brothers, he graduated from Harvard, uh, in Kudos May. Kudos to him, man. Congratulations. Yeah. He graduated from Harvard in May. So I flew up to Boston for that. Okay. Um, and, uh, all next year I plan on traveling a lot. Like I'm going to be, I'm gonna be traveling a lot because I plan on not, I mean, I'm planning on submitting for Sundance 2020, but I plan on going to Sundance and like right next month, mm-hmm. uh, f- just to go and experience it. Cause I never experienced it before. Where's it going to be at? Uh, it's gonna be it's uh it's the same place every year. Uh, it's not Toronto, I believe it's it? Utah. Utah, yeah, it is. I believe Utah. it's in Utah. You're right. You're right. If I remember correctly, don't yeah, get me yeah, lying. Yeah. But I believe it's, it's in somewhere. Utah. Yeah, it's one of those places. All right. Yeah, and so uh, have you been to South by Southwest? So oh yeah, Boston? there was a point in time I went every year and I got to cover it. Basically, uh, um, when I was doing, I keep mentioning my radio days because it was such, a, but it was such a pivotal mm-hmm. point in my life. Like it, mm-hmm. it, it added so much to my life mm-hmm. um but yeah we went every year from a radio show and we covered it that's where i got most of my interviews like i had a friend who owned this sneaker store that sway would do a live broadcast from mm-hmm. every year and so he gave me the hook up that the minute an artist would leave sway they would come to me mm-hmm. so like ti big crit dj premier pete rock russell simmons once they got off the air with sway come over to me you know what i'm saying mm, so i covered if you look on my youtube i got like three south by southwest recaps where you see everybody like that's shouting out my radio show live from the underground that's what's up um so yeah i've been so um that's awesome that's like a three-hour drive so mm-hmm. that wasn't bad but yeah traveling i definitely plan because i've never been to new york mm-hmm. um i plan on going to new york and definitely going back to la so that'll be dope yeah that'll be traveling dope. will definitely be something i do more this year Cause um you know there's a lot of restraints too because I used to have a nine to five. Gotcha. Uh, I'm currently starting my own business, so that's giving me more flexibility to move. Yeah, uh, not my choice, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? But like I got laid off in August, mm-hmm. and they laid off like my whole department, so like hundreds of people just gone. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I I uh, you know I applied for every like because I'm in the marketing communications field, mm-hmm. so I applied for every like marketing PR ad firm there was mm-hmm. I was either too qualified not qualified enough or I had experience but not the experience they were looking for mm-hmm. that whole thing mm-hmm. and it just led me to believe that maybe I should try maybe I'm supposed to be working for myself because mm-hmm. I a lot of the plans I have for myself I knew I man I'm gonna have to uh take off of work a lot for this mm-hmm. and but and so with that in mind maybe it's 
maybe that's because I'm not supposed to be constrained by anything. So mm-hmm. currently in the midst of, of starting my own business, we're about to get that popping off pretty soon. So nice. so far, I've been doing pretty well for myself. That's what's up, man. Hey, I always, I always encourage brothers, man. Start your own thing. Do your own thing. Yeah. Pour your heart into it. Find what it is that you're good at. Work, you know, get better at it. Find a way to monetize it. Your life will be better for that. Yeah. You know, than any experiences working for anybody else. Yeah. But, you know, we do what we got to do. Um, was there anything I missed, man? Was there anything you, you, you wanted to mention? Man, you covered pretty much everything, man. I was able to really get out everything I wanted to say, I think. Um, anything coming up? Yeah, coming up. Um, just uh, just those shows I talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, just be on the lookout for all of that. You can follow uh, if you follow me on social media, which I'll shout out in a minute. Like you can see my journey with everything. Um, really, I guess what I want to say is um, not to get too like, you know what I mean, too like overly preachy, mm-hmm. but you know, life is short, man. Mm -hmm. and the moments you spend doing things that make you genuinely happy matter agreed because not only is it short for you but it's short for everyone around you like the person you love could not be there tomorrow Mm -hmm. um so just spend every moment you have doing whatever you can to make yourself happy to put yourself in a position to where what you're doing makes you happy and being around people that make you happy like constant positive energy is a must especially nowadays with so much negativity around Mm -hmm. um so i'll just encourage anybody whatever it is you want to do just make sure you go out of your way to make sure that you spend whatever time you have on this earth doing something that makes you happy Mm -hmm. that's what that's what that's what everything has been like this whole year has been like me because it's not that i have to chase happiness happiness has been very close to me and it's Mm -hmm. it's right in front of me but it it's it's been my goal to just keep that the only thing that's around me everything that brings negativity or frustration or anger get that as far away from me as possible Mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying stay positive yeah and i i i you know encourage everybody else to do the same agreed tell everybody where to find you bro uh all my social media handles uh are j will etc that's j a y w i l e t c um if you're wondering what etc is that is a company that i I, that's a brand that uh i was really forefront with in the beginning but it's been kind of in the background i'm I'm about to bring it back though with these films and everything so um yeah so j will etc make sure you follow me on everything kind of follow the journey um i do follow back so um and i do have the app that lets me know if you unfollow me after you follow me so uh (laughs) don't think you're slick because you're not uh, <laughs> I got you. Um, and that's it, man. Hey, I, man. I appreciate you having me, man. Hey, man. I appreciate you coming on, brother. Man, I'm 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 excited for everything you got going on. Um, I'm here. You know, we built a good rapport, bro. Of course. Um, I'm sure this is not gonna be the last time that that they see us both in the same place in Definitely front of not. mics. Um, so yeah, man. I'm just excited for the future, brother. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. For coming on, man. Thank you. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you, man. Thank you. Hey, you guys out there, make sure that you subscribe to the Bill for Anything podcast. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit that like button. Leave a comment down below. If you're listening to it on iTunes, please leave a review on iTunes. It does help the show. Um, I'm available on all major platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, etc. You can find it. So leave a comment. Let us know how we're doing. My guest today, thank you again, Jay Will. Man, appreciate it. Appreciate you, bro. We out. Peace and love, you guys.